Uh, Madam President. Senator from New Mexico. Thank you for the recognition, Madam President. And Madam President, I ask uh, unanimous consent that the following members of my staff, uh, Ned Adrians, Lauren Arias, uh, Clinton Cowan, Renee Gasper, Kara Gilbert, Annie Orloff, Leo Sheehan, Lisa Van Timshi be given floor privileges for the remainder of the 116th Congress. Without objection. Thank you very much. And thank you, Senator Schumer, for those uh, kind remarks earlier. You know, as you know, I announced I wasn't running for re-election yet last year. And if I'd known everyone was going to be so nice to me, I might have announced it earlier. <laughs> I'm not the only senator who's giving a farewell speech. Many of us got to hear Lamar Alexander last week. Lamar is the perfect example of what a United States senator should be. Before I was wet behind the ears in the Senate, my first week here, Lamar invited me and my wife, Jill, to dinner. There it began. Jill and Lamar's wife, Honey, became fast friends, and Lamar and I grew closer, building the kind of friendship that is essential here in the Senate. We worked together to get things done for our states, bolstering our national laboratories and conserving our great outdoors. Something else we shared was Mario, our barber in the Senate barbershop. And to be honest, that's the best place to learn the wisdom of the Senate, sitting in Mario's chair. Friendships like I have with Lamar and with Mario are what I will miss most about the Senate, the friendships. And because, as any good senator will tell you, friendships are what get you over the finish line. I will cherish the friendships I've forged over the last 12 years. I will miss serving the people of New Mexico in Congress. The greatest honor of my life has been doing that. And I'm confident that New Mexico is in good hands with my friend Senator Heinrich, my great partner over the last eight years, his dedicated advocacy for our communities, his love of the land, and all of that, as Martin, has been an inspiration. And with Senator-elect Ben Ray Lujan, who I have the privilege of calling a friend and who I know will fight for New Mexico families every single day in the Senate. I will miss the righteous struggle we take up in these halls to build a more perfect union. And I will miss all of you, my staff, colleagues, and everyone who works around the clock, the unsung heroes who keep the Senate running, people like John, Lee, and Mary Ann, all of the folks that are here in front of you. You know, there are too many to thank. First and foremost, I thank my staff. Every senator here knows we're only as good as the people on our team. And my friend, as my friend Patrick Leahy says, we senators are often just a constitutional <laughs> impediment to the staff. And over the years, I've been blessed with staffers who are full of talent, skill, drive, and heart. Madam President, I don't want to leave anyone out, and so I ask permission to enter into the record a list of all my staff who have been part of Team Udall and I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to each of you for your hard work, your public service, and your commitment. And I want to thank my family, to my parents, Stuart and Lee Udall, who instilled in me the will to do good and to be good. And to my brothers and sisters, my sister Lori, who's here, and cousins, who have supported me throughout my three decades in elected office. Thank you to our daughter, Amanda, my forever campaign manager, and our son-in-law, Judge Jim, just recently a judge in New Mexico, for their constant love and support. And most importantly, thank you to my brilliant and beautiful partner of 42 years, Jill Cooper Hudol. Jill has been my rock. 
She's been my chief counsel. She's been my everything. And I couldn't have asked for a better partner to have this public service adventure. And it's truly been an adventure for this son of the West. For after 20 years, 20 plus years, it's time for me to go back home. As the great Western writer Wallace Stegner wrote, it is not unusual, it is not an unusual life curve for Westerners to live and to be shaped by the bigness, the sparseness, space, clarity, and hopefulness of the West. To go away for study and enlargement and perspective that distance and dissatisfaction can give, and then to return to what pleases the sight and enlists the loyalty and demands the commitment. Stegner said that we fall into two categories. We're either boomers or stickers. Boomers pillage and run. Stickers are motivated by affection, by such a love for place and its life that they want to preserve it and remain in it. And I'm telling you here today, I'm a sticker. I'm also an optimist, and I want to be more accurate. I'm a troubled optimist. I've tried to open my eyes to the challenges we face while never losing conviction in our ability to meet those challenges. As the scientist Rachel Carson said, one way to open your eyes is to ask yourself, what if I had never seen this before? What if I knew I would never see it again? I believe this nation has arrived at a moment when we are opening our eyes to the enormous challenges before us and also to their solutions. Our planet is in crisis, facing mass extinction and climate change. Our people are in crisis, ravaged by a pandemic that has laid bare the, in the inequities of our society. And our democracy is in crisis as the people's faith in their government is shaken. We cannot solve one of these crises without solving the others. And that's why I'm troubled. But all I have to do to be optimistic is look around, look around me. I look at the young people across this country who are calling for change, for climate action, for voting rights, and for immigrant rights, for economic and environmental and racial justice. They've held sit-ins in my office, probably yours too. And they're demanding that we do better. And their determination gives me hope. And I'm optimistic as I look back on the small acts of kindness and the big acts of progress that define my time in the Congress. I believe that there are lessons in these accomplishments. Now, you may know me as someone who wants to reform the filibuster. But to be clear, I've always supported the talking filibuster. So if you'll indulge me, and by the rules of the Senate, you have to. <laughs> you can leave, but I get to keep talking. I, I'd like to talk about a few of the highlights of my career and what I've learned from them. As you know, protecting America's outdoor treasures is a cause close to my heart. It's something of a family project. My family homesteaded in the West almost 180 years ago. And like generations of Udalls before me, I grew up with a special connection to the land, to the gorgeous, untamed beauty of the West, to the 60-mile vistas, snow-covered, rugged mountains, alpine lakes, and abundant wildlife. Mitt Romney knows this. Our great-grandfathers settled the same small Western community. Stegner called the West the geography of hope. It sure is for me. It's what has inspired much of my public service. And that's why I'm so proud of what we've accomplished together to conserve our natural heritage. On the Appropriations Committee, we've worked together for resources for our public lands and environmental protection on a bipartisan basis. In the face of massive proposed cuts, 
And we've held off anti-environmental riders that have no place in these bills. Thank you to my friend Lisa Murkowski, who has been the best partner I could ask for in this work. In New Mexico, where public lands are central to our way of life, we've had enormous success unlocking tens of thousands of acres of enchanted land for all of us to enjoy and for Martin to hunt on, you know, every now and then. Each of these efforts was collaborative and community-driven, and that collaborative work culminated in one of the biggest conservation victories in American history, the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act. Thanks to the determination of a grassroots coalition and many champions here in Congress, we got this bill over the finish line. For the first time, we've realized the promise of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the promise my father envisioned 55 years ago, almost 55 years, when he helped create our nation's most successful conservation program. After more than 20 years of fighting for this in Congress, I'm thrilled we got it done, and we got it done together, together. The law is a model for how conservation and economic recovery go hand in hand. It will help us achieve the urgent goal of protecting 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. Enacting the Great American Outdoors Act at a time of immense division is a tremendous feat, and it tells us a lot about what we're capable of. It tells us that conservation is popular, a political winner. Environmental protection can be an area of cooperative action. It must be if humanity is to survive and prosper. As I talk about my love of the land, I cannot neglect to acknowledge how much I've learned from the original stewards of this land, Native Americans, indigenous people. I got my start in politics working with my father, fighting alongside the Navajo uranium miners who had been hurt, many had died, and they had been hurt by this nation, by our nuclear weapons program. My work as Vice Chair of the Indian Affairs Committee has been the honor of my lifetime. And another area where this committee has achieved bipartisan progress. I thank my chairman, Senator Hoven and Senator Barrasso, before him for their partnership and friendship. We've worked together as a committee for better health care, education, housing, and urgently needed resources for Native communities, especially as they battle this pandemic. The federal government's obligation to uphold its trust and treaty obligations is sacred. Some of my proudest achievements have been the result of working with tribal leaders to advance Indian country's priorities to support New Mexico's 23 tribes. Recently, a bipartisan coalition passed legislation to strengthen the principle of tribal self-governance, provide Native entrepreneurs critical resources and secure investments in Native language revitalization. The achievements I remember most fondly are ones like these, those we did together. Indeed, those are the only kinds of achievements that are possible in this body. Take the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act, our landmark reform of, of the Toxic Substances Control Act. It was the biggest environmental reform in a generation. I was proud to lead that effort to protect our families from toxic chemicals. It was hard work and it took years. But if you can get a project where Jim Inhofe and Ed Markey are working for the same goal, you can get a lot done around here. It's another example of how friendships get you over the finish line. My friendship with David Vitter, my partner on Tosca reform, was sort of like Ted Kennedy and Orrin Hatch's friendship, a political odd couple. Me, the son of Mormon pioneers, David, a son of New Orleans, two very different political backgrounds and different views 
on the big problems before us. But I'll never forget the dinner we had after Frank Lattenberg passed away when we decided to take on Tosca reform. We looked at each other after that dinner and shook hands and said, we're going to get this done. And we did. It passed the Senate unanimously. We agreed there was a problem. We found common ground on a solution. That's still possible in the Senate. But I didn't come here to just list accomplishments. You can check my Twitter feed to see if you want to see more of that. Uh, I do want to share some final thoughts about challenges our nation faces before I leave the Senate. I believe that for all of us here, public service is a calling. It certainly is for me. In my life, I've had the privilege of learning from many dedicated servants. One of them was Senator John McCain. Senator McCain was a friend to me and a friend to my family. When John first came to the house, my Uncle Mo, big Uncle Mo, 6'5", took him under his wing. John did the same for me, and we worked together on issues like campaign finance reform, Native American issues, and others. John often said to me, we disagree in politics, but not in life. Let's remember that. We disagree in politics, but not in life. My great-grandfather helped settle St. John's, a small farming and cattle community on the Arizona-New Mexico border in the 1880s. He had an embroidery that hung on his frontier home that read, if the good folks don't get into politics, the scoundrels will take over. I believe there are a lot of good folks here in the Senate, but the system we're caught in makes it too hard to work together. To remember that we we need to remember that we disagree in politics, but not in life. And I'm not the first to say in a farewell address, and I won't be the last, but the Senate is broken. The Senate is broken. And it's not working for the American people. We are becoming better and better political warriors. We're good at landing a punch, at exposing the hypocrisy, and riling each other up, but, aren't, but we aren't fostering our better angels. Our peacemaking skills are atrophying. Every hurt takes time to heal, and each time we hurt each other, it sets us back. But unfortunately, the structures we have built reward us for hurting one another. We need to reform those structures or we'll never make progress, make that progress we need to make. I've proposed Senate rules changes when I was in the minority and when I was in the majority to make sure this institution does not remain a graveyard for progress. The founders did not envision a Senate requiring 60 votes to act. The filibuster came to be through historical accident and it is now woven into the institutional framework. The promise of the filibuster is that the majority will find common ground with the minority. But the reality of the filibuster is paralysis, a deep paralysis. On top of this, we have a campaign finance system that is out of control. John McCain told you that over and over again. And he called money the cancer growing on our democracy, and John McCain knew a lot about cancer. Secret money floods campaigns to buy influence instead of letting the voters speak. Voting rights are under attack. We can do our best to be good people in a system like that, but it's no surprise that America's faith in government is declining. These structures are anti-democratic. They reward extremism. They punish compromise. Our government is supposed to respond to the will of the majority while protecting the rights of the minority. Instead, we have the tyranny of the minority. That tyranny is super wealthy, politically powerful, and dangerously out of touch with the American people. 
the majority of Americans support pandemic relief, health care for every American, action on global warming, racial justice and police reform, and so many other priorities that don't see much progress in the Senate. People are losing their faith in the system, rightfully so. We have to do something to fix this. If we are to take bold action necessary to tackle the urgent problems before us, we must reform our democracy. We must make it easier to vote. We must end the dominance of big money. And we must root out corruption. And we do not have any time to waste. We have no choice but to be bold because the crises before us demand bravery. Hundreds of thousands of Americans are dead from a pandemic, a pandemic that this administration has callously ignored, a consequence of its continued rejection of science. In New Mexico, we've surpassed 108 cases, over 1,700 are dead, and tens of thousands have lost their jobs. Meanwhile, our nation is facing dual climate and nature crises of epic proportions. Earlier this year, much of the American West was engulfed in wildfire. As an arid state, New Mexico is in the crosshairs of climate change. We lose a football field's worth of nature every 30 seconds. A million species are at risk of extinction because of human activity. Our planet's life support system is under threat. As the climate crisis worsens, ecosystems are destroyed, and as ecosystems are destroyed, we emit more harmful greenhouse gases. We cannot solve one crisis without solving the other. Protecting nature is about protecting humanity. It's just that simple. And marginalized communities, communities of color, low-income communities, and indigenous people are bearing the worst consequences of the environmental destruction and pollution caused by the rich and powerful. We have the power to solve these crises, the power and the obligation. All it takes is clear eyes and political will and remembering that we may disagree in politics, but not in the future that we want for our children. When I was a young man, I spent the summer of 1969 in the mountains of Colorado teaching students wilderness skills. Each night we look up and open our eyes to the moon. It seemed impossibly far away. I'm reminded of Rachel Carson's words, one way to open your eyes is to ask, what if I had never seen this before? When we emerge from the wilderness, we learned what Apollo 11 had achieved. We had landed on the moon, the moon that seemed so impossibly far away. We should never forget that we can do, we, all of us, can do the impossible when we open our eyes to the challenge and work together to meet it. So I return home to the West. So as I return home to the West, I am clear-eyed about, even troubled by, how far away our destination is. But I am optimistic that we will get there like we always have. 